Good morning, and I am so excited to be here. Uh, I, I want to say how grateful and excited I am that uh, Paul has agreed to do this interview this morning. I'm looking forward to meeting him in person at the LitCon se uh, session and um, information about all that and a lot of other things uh, uh, are going to be in the written part of the blog for this. Um, to tell you a little bit about Paul, and let me do a quick screen share here to do that. Here we go. Uh, okay. And you're getting to see my grandchildren. That wasn't intended. Okay. And here we go. So uh, Paul has, is a professor of education at Furman University. Uh, he is really well credentialed. He's uh, done many things, uh, written uh, editor for the English Journal, uh, a whole series of things. If you haven't read his blog, folks, if you haven't, please uh, use the links that I give you uh, to get to the blog. And in just a minute, I'm going to stop talking and give him a chance to talk about himself. And we are going to talk about his uh, book how and the ideas in it, how to end the reading war and serve li literacy needs of all students. So I'm about to stop my share and shut up <laughs> and let Paul take over. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into the questions. Sure thing. And I really appreciate this opportunity um, and the support for my book and the shared work that we do. I really appreciate everybody that's kind of stepping up for literacy. I am, as people will be able to hear, I am a lifelong Southerner, um, and I was a high school English teacher in the upstate of South Carolina for 18 years, and I'm starting my 20th year at Furman, and it seems kind of shocking. I still sort of think of myself as a high school English teacher, and but I've been in the field of literacy for four decades, and my doctoral work was on Lula Brandt, so um, I've just been steeped in literacy my entire professional career. Um, and um, I, I think that's sort of, you know, led to a little bit of the frustration with, you know, um, some of these movements and how we think about literacy and reading. Um, and uh, you mentioned uh, your grandchildren. I have two wonderful grandchildren. I have uh, my grandson just started 4K and my granddaughter just started second grade. So I have even more reason to be concerned about how we teach kids to read. Yeah, I love the grandpa gig and and exactly. We wanna make sure that our grandchildren get a, a, a literacy legacy. Okay, well, let's get into it then. Uh, talking about your book. Uh, how to end the reading wars and implications of it. Um, uh, my first question is this, recent issues of the Reading Research Quarterly, uh, P. David Pearson's new book, uh, and I happen to have a copy of that here, uh, both make the case that it's not settled science. So what do you think, Paul? Is this settled science or what's going on here? People, there are people that are saying it, it, it is. Or is it really? Uh, talk about that. So uh, I think that's a really great first question, and I, I think that hits at the core of the situation. Uh, since the book came out, I think I have um, been fortunate to uh, speak on this topic quite a few times, and I've kind of shifted to my mantra is now not simple, not settled. So I think that I Love think that, that is that. Love that. <laughs> and I, and I think that's our best message uh, because that's the I think those are the two problems. Um, and what to me is kind of depressingly ironic is the COVID situation ha has really vividly taught us the importance of science and the temporal nature of scientific knowledge. Um, and one, one analogy I think is important is early on, we were very concerned about surfaces, like cleaning surfaces to avoid COVID. And now that seems that's not as important and, and there are other, so we've shifted our understanding and we will continue to understand COVID better and better. So science is never settled. Science is, we know this now based on the evidence, but the minute the evidence changes, the minute the evidence develops, we have to shift with it. And I would add one other thing that is kind of bothersome about the settled argument is 
the, the misunderstanding is it can't be settled for all children. And I think that'll be sort of one of the refrains of this discussion is I'm very concerned about the science of reading movement is very monolithic. Um, they're endorsing things like all students must have systematic intensive phonics. All students must be screened for dyslexia. So phonics is not a problem. Screening for dyslexia is not a problem. It's the all students must. And things like generalizations in science always have outliers. So anything in science that appears to work for the general population, there are some people for whom that thing is dangerous, and there are some people for whom that thing doesn't work. So I think that's where, I mean, I really think this is a good place to start, this whole idea of settled. No, science is never settled, but that doesn't mean that we don't know things. We know a lot of things. Okay, I, I'm going to click in with a couple, my two cents worth. Uh, first of all, my mantra is, what works with one kid doesn't always work with another. And every teacher out there knows that. Yes. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, I spent my career helping the kids for whom the main program didn't work. So I'm totally familiar with the idea that whatever, I don't care what program you adopt, there's always going to be some kids for whom it doesn't work. And you need somebody like me, a reading specialist going in there and helping those kids. And you can't tie their hands by saying, oh no, you can't use this or you can't use that. So thank you for letting me vent for a second. Sure. Okay, uh, 50 years here uh, in, in uh, doing things. Okay, in light of the answer to that previous question, does it make any sense at all to effectively ban selected practices found in balanced approaches to reading. Uh, things like reading recovery and workshop teaching and guided reading. Does research justify uh, calling those failed approaches? And some, some of them uh, have gotten to the point of where they're, har they're calling them harmful approaches. Is there, does the research really bear that out? I really love this question, Sam, and it's, it's, it's given me an opportunity to say something I don't think I've done yet, which I'm, I'm always excited about. So okay. as, a, as a methods person uh, for you know, 20 years now, uh, one of the uh, things that I use is Zimmelman, Daniel, and Hyde's best practices approach. And uh, best practice itself has some problems, and some people have misunderstand that. But the best thing about Zimmelman, Daniels, and Hyde is at the end of each chapter, they have a chart and they say, increase these practices, decrease these practices. So effectively, they're not endorsing any practices and they're not rejecting any practices. And for me, as somebody teaching somebody to teach, that's brilliant. The, you, your toolbox should be filled. Uh, at any moment, depending on student needs, you may need to shift to some practice that somebody somewhere says don't do. Uh, and I always point to things like direct instruction and lecturing. Uh, I, I really don't know anybody that says don't do those. Um, I do think that a lot of us would say that those should be used in moderation uh, and we should be doing those things depending on student needs. So. I am someone who knows the research doesn't support isolated grammar instruction, you know, but I also know I have found individual students who thrive with it and their writing does improve with isolated grammar instruction. So the, 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 the point of your question there, I absolutely should not be banning anything. Um, and absolute, I'm, I'm talking about instructional practices. Uh, and absolutely should not be demanding or mandating that all students must do any practice either. Um, where the banning probably should be are uh, the contradictions in the science of reading movement, which has allowed states to uh, implement grade retention, which science doesn't support, where that's, that's the huge contradiction. Uh, on the one hand, science of reading advocates are screaming science and research, and on the other hand, they're allowing very clearly harmful practices, and, and grade retention is extremely harmful. Okay, I'm, I'm going to throw my two cents worth in again uh, on the grade retention thing. 
um, it, it, when you start pushing them on it, they'll say, but wait, it, uh, the, our data shows that uh, the, the uh, impact isn't really from the grade retention. And my question to them always is, well, okay, if it isn't, then why on earth are you doing such an anti-scientific um, uh, practice of retaining students? Um, so I think the Florida model or any of those uh, need to be called out. Okay, moving on. Um, what's your take on some of, oh, oh, you know what? You anticipated my next question, which is what's your take on uh, the retention question? You just answered it. So okay. well, I think we can, I think we should probably add, I mean, you mentioned Florida. I think that's really important because everybody, another, um, piece of mis misinformation in the science, or I would say contradiction in the science of reading uh, narrative is this embracing of Mississippi. Uh, so one thing is there's absolutely, and I still, I keep looking, I look constantly, there's no research that Mississippi's uh, improved NAEP scores are caused by embracing and implementing the science of reading. There's zero research showing that. There is some preliminary evidence that Mississippi has inflated their test scores by extreme grade retention. And you mentioned a minute ago, we have quite a bit of data. Florida did the same thing. Uh, Florida has proven you can inflate test scores in the short term with grade retention, but Florida has also proven that in a few years, those gains disappear and those students that are retained still uh, suffer the harmful consequences of dropping out and falling behind. So it's very likely that Mississippi's improved NAEP scores are because they're one of the most, um, or one of the worst <laughs> uh, <laughs> offenders of uh, extreme retention, which disproportionately impacts black students. Um, I've started showing it. I've got the data. Uh, their percentage of retention of black students is, is nearly criminal. And it, that is probably the source of the grade, um, the score improvement on NAEP. Uh, so yes, I think it's worth talking about Florida. We already have the evidence. So the truth is, Grade retention can inflate standardized test scores in the short term. Those are mirages. Those, those uh, gains disappear, sometimes by as early as eighth grade, but definitely by high school. And then students still suffer the negative consequences. There's, there's 40, 50, 60 years of data on grade retention. It's only harmful. It is not helpful. And I, I know that NSET, uh went out of their way to um, make that very clear and, and make that available. So uh, kudos to them for doing that. Um, I know you know Camborn and Camborn Crouch recently said, uh, we should stop using the reading wars metaphor and instead use a metaphor of the reading quilt uh, with different sides adding different pieces to the quilt. And uh, I, I'm finding that's a, as I blog out in the rest and people are talking on Twitter feeds, I'm finding people are finding that a, a, a good idea. So uh, do you see any hope for such an idea? Uh, and uh, what other ideas might you have on how to foster cooperation instead of a conflict in all this? Uh, uh, bottom line, is there any kind of com potential common ground in all this? Yeah, so my, uh, I'd say I'm discouraged. That's what, um, honestly, that's what balanced literacy was. I mean, whole language was a wonderful philosophy of teaching literacy. And that's all it is. Whole language is a philosophy. Balanced literacy is a philosophy. There are not programs, but whole language left so much in the hands of day-to-day -day teaching for teachers that the, and I was a public school teacher, teaching, uh, you know, a full-time <laughs> teaching position in K-12 education is incredibly tiring. It is incredibly hard. And most students, I mean, excuse me, most teachers honestly don't have time to create all their own material. 
So balanced literacy was an effort to give structure to the whole language philosophy. And the whole fo language philosophy is what we talked about earlier. Give any student whatever he or she or they need to become literate. Whole language never said do not teach phonics. Whole language has never said don't do this, only do that. It is child-centered. So I'm a little discouraged because what you're describing and what Camborn and Crouch are describing is essentially what balanced literacy says. It is a reading quilt. It is your toolbox must be full. Your toolbox must be full of, of any strategy that a child might need, whether they are considered a mainstream student or whether they're considered a special needs student. Um, so I, I completely agree with the concept of the reading quilt, but I also completely still embrace whole language. I still completely embrace balanced literacy. And I will say this as many times as I have to, uh, balanced literacy has not failed students. We have failed balanced literacy. Uh, the big problem, and I discovered this um, a couple of uh, years ago, I spoke at the Wisconsin uh, uh, Reading Association and I, I really had my eyes open. Uh, the problem for most teachers was that the reading program adopted became the focus of how they were held accountable. So the problem becomes once a district um, uh, adopts a program or a school adopts a program, too many times teachers are held accountable for implementing the program, which is not what we should be holding teachers accountable for. We should be holding teachers accountable for giving every single student every possible opportunity to grow and develop in literacy. And the reading program is simply a tool. Uh, so I think that's where uh, we've kind of fallen, uh, uh, where, we, where we've failed. We failed balanced literacy. Balanced literacy is not a problem. Uh, it doesn't uh, demand anything and it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, say you can't do something. So yes, the reading quilt is perfectly great metaphor. Um, my problem with the whole concept here though is we've already tried that. Um, I, I hate to say this, but as long as the science of reading advocates keep using all students must, there's no way to compromise with that. Uh, as long as the science of reading people uh, keep demanding that we screen every single student for dyslexia, there's no compromise with that. Uh, as long as the science of reading people, um, you know, say that all students must have systematic intensive phonics instruction, there's no compromise with that. Um, I, again, another analogy I would put is there's no compromise with people who uh, say that we should allow corporal punishment. Uh, we simply shouldn't. Uh, we should not retain students. So I am a, I, I absolutely understand the concept of compromise. Uh, I just don't see much room because there already is a compromised model or a compromising model, and that's balanced literacy. Balanced literacy would say if you're a teacher and you have a student who needs systematic intensive phonics, you're professionally and morally obligated to provide that. I don't know what else you can do. Um, they, they create sort of this straw man argument. There, I don't know anybody, and, I, and my great friend Stephen Krashen says this all the time, there's no people out there advocating for zero phonics instruction. That's a, that's a false, um, you know, that's, that's an urban legend. It doesn't exist. Uh, it's sort of like the critical race theory attack. Uh, critical race theory is not in schools. And the no phonics instruction movement doesn't exist. So uh, I, I feel compassion for your efforts to you know, find a common ground. And I, I just, I worry that there are some things that we just can't compromise on. Okay, uh, what I found is that um, I, I almost divide the science of reading folks into two categories. Those that say, um, it totally works and there and there are no limitations to it and those that don't and I, I found that there are some that say oh yeah we see some limitations within the science of reading ideas 
And those folks uh, talk to me and can be talked to. I've even interviewed some of them. So uh, there's where I see the hope. Uh, but before I, I get to the last thing, which is your final thoughts, I, I wonder if you could, I know I'm kind of sad that people have forgotten about the first grade studies and what, uh, and that fund that created that fundamental shift uh, and found that uh, the, the key is the teacher. So I, I wonder for, especially for our folks that aren't aware of the first grade studies and what they found all those years ago, uh, could you just give us a little background on that? And uh, uh, I, see, I personally see the first grade studies as the reason why we should empower teachers and why teachers are the final, uh, are, are the key to, to solving our literacy problems. Um, uh, your, a little background for folks that don't know about them and uh, your take on that. Well, I, I would expand that even to, um, you know, as I mentioned before, Lula Brandt, uh, her work goes back into the 1920s. And uh, we've had incredibly powerful, very, you know, high quality quantitative research on reading and writing instruction for a century now. I mean, for a century. And I would say some things do stand out. Uh, the, the professionalism, the knowledge of the teacher, uh, the teacher being student-centered. Um, and I would say going back, going all the way up to even the National Reading Panel um, and that research, it, it's not bad research. It's been misrepresented and it's been misunderstood, which Joanne Yatvin mentioned. But one thing I'll point out too is Linda Darling-Hammond has research from the 1990s uh, on NAEP. And it, it shows higher test scores correlated with whole language classrooms. And so, I mean, the, I would say the bigger picture for the average person is there's plenty of good research. I mean, what you're mentioning here, what we know about first grade, what we know about pre-K, what we know about third graders, there's plenty of research. And I think we can kind of tie some things together. The problem with the research on, you know, uh, beginning reading is it's not simple and it's not settled. Learning to read is not a simple process. And I think that's where we're getting really bogged down. So I, I'm not sure if I'm really addressing what you're asking, because I don't know that I, the average person, I'm not sure how specific we need to be other than saying there's no one on what I would say our side who's saying there isn't good research. We're saying there is good research and there's plenty of research. It just doesn't provide the silver bullet that the science of reading movement tends to suggest. And I think part of the problem is the science of reading movement is actually a media movement. Um, it, you know, it, it's being, it started with Emily Hanford, who was a journalist, and uh, Hanford still is speaking at conferences as an expert. And she's a journalist. She's not a literacy person. She's not a researcher. Um, and I think that's part of the problem is uh, a lot of times public messages are overly simplified. Uh, so do we have research that phonemic awareness and, and instruction in phonics matters for students? Absolutely. Um, do we have evidence that there are plenty of students who actually don't need what we would call structured phonetic instruction because they've somehow acquired the beginning, you know, tools of reading even before they started school? I'm one of them. I, I could read before I started school because of my mother uh, who had no training. Um, but there are tons. I mean, there, there are too many. There are too many students who don't acquire things so-called naturally that do need help, that do need direct instruction, that do need structure. Um, so yes, we have tons of research. Um, and I think that's what I think the, the, the average person needs to understand. Okay, uh, well, 
I think you just gave your final thoughts, but I'll, I'll leave that open one more time and remind my uh, readers that you're going to be speaking at LitCon uh, and uh, that that information will be in the blog. But uh, the last chant, anything else you want to say? Before, uh, well, I know you want to do your mantra. <laughs> uh, well, I would but, just... Uh, beyond that. I, I would just say that, you know, don't get, don't fall into the trap. Um, decoding uh, word pronunciation, reading aloud, uh, are not literacy. There are some parts of literacy. Uh, literacy is way more complicated than that. Reading is comprehension. Reading is engagement. Uh, my most recent blog is about watching my own granddaughter, uh, become a better reader because she's playing Animal Crossing on Switch, uh, which is a reading intensive game. And she was just reading words aloud and wasn't paying attention. And once, uh, you know, once she was, you know, pushed, so, you know, and told, read that again, it tells you what to do. Sort of a light bulb went on. So, um, yes, I'll do the mantra. Uh, reading is not simple. Uh, the science is not settled. Um, but we do know what to do. And I would also add, especially for the dyslexia advocates. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful people who care deeply about their children. Uh, one thing I worry about is I absolutely 100% support no student should go unserved. No student should go unserved. And that's including students who may have something like dyslexia that we can identify, whether or not they do, um, I would also add the dyslexia research uh, is not simple and not settled either. Uh, you have a wide spectrum of professionals who don't even believe dyslexia is a singular thing. Um, the definition, we, are, we don't have a clear definition. We don't have a clear way to identify dyslexia, but that does not mean we should not be serving all students. So I would say uh, there are many of us who uh, are strongly in support of serving every single student. Uh, so we, we, we need to get, don't need to get sidetracked by the idea that some of us don't wanna serve students. Okay, and uh, boy, what, what a powerful message there at the end uh, that, we, that our purpose here is to, the students are our boss, our purpose is to serve every one of them. So thank you for that. Uh, and readers, there'll be information uh, about, uh, your blog, your blog and your new book and uh, LitCon and all that in the written part of the blog. And I'm going to stop the recording now and sign off and say thank you so much again. Good, thank you. Uh, good, good morning. Bye-bye. <laughs>